Lovely. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our Making Sense of Merkel Cell Carcinoma um, webinar today. And um, I'd like to start off with um, welcome to a country. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live, which is Garingai and Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and recognize the continuing con connection to land, water, and community. I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. So we've got a very exciting afternoon, evening uh, lined up for you. Uh, we'd like to thank Merck for their support uh, in um, enabling us to have this event. And I'd like to introduce you to the speakers. Uh, so we've got Dr. Wen Zhu. And Dr. Wen Zhu is a staff specialist medical oncologist at um, Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane and specialises in breast, lung and skin cancers and has a particular interest in Merkel cell carcinoma. He's also been um, a melanoma and immuno-oncology fellowship in, at the Peter McCallum Centre in Melbourne in 2016. And at the moment, he's CIA of the MRFF funded IMAT trial, which uh, we will hear some more about. Our next speaker is Professor Gerald Fogarty, who is um, Director of Radiation Oncology at the Mata Hospital here in Sydney. Um, he also, well, he trained at Peter McCallum and he's a radiation oncologist with the Mel Melanoma Institute of Australia. He's been an author of multiple um, radiotherapy uh, papers and he is also um, on the a board member of the melanoma and skin cancer trials group and chair of the Australian Merkel interest group and our final um, professional speaker is Richard Tottle who's a research scientist and head of the rare disease oncogenomics laboratory within the department of clinical pathology at the University of Melbourne um, his work has been highly translational with a focus on the adoption of uh, breakthrough genomic technology for discovery and clinical applications. And he currently leads collaborative research and national clinical studies on rare diseases, including cancers of unknown primary Merkel cell carcinoma and other you know, neuroendocrine malignancies. And our final speaker is uh, Jonathan Pincus, who is going to give his um, patient perspective and he is also the chair of the consumer group that's um, affiliated with Amigos. Behind the scenes we've got Kate Wakeland who is doing a lot of our technical support and um, going to make sure that this all runs beautifully smoothly and we've also got Simone Layden who is our CEO and co-founder of Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia and she is going to be looking after the um, Q&A section. Um, so with doing that we're going to do the Q&A towards the end. Please put in the chat section um, any questions that you would like to um, ask throughout the whole of the presentations and we'll get that um, answered at the end of it. And also there will be a survey with the link at the end of the webinar that we'll get you to do an evaluation of um, the event. So without further ado, um, I will hand over to um, Wen Zhu. And Wen will get rid of mine and um, be talking about what is Merkel cell carcinoma and medical oncology management. Thank you, Wen. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Meredith. Um, uh, I just wanted to double check that everyone can see my screen, that it's sharing okay? It's fantastic. Thanks, Wen. Great, great. Um, so my name is Wen Zhu. I'm a medical oncologist based at the PA Hospital in Brisbane. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure um, uh, for me this afternoon to um, um, be able to give you just a, a general overview on Merkel cell carcinoma um, and touch on the optimal the optimal oncology management um, in 2020. So just a bit of background epidemiology. Merkel's cell carcinoma is a very rare cancer. It's an aggressive neuroendocrine cancer of the skin. Um, like many skin cancers, it, it does have a higher incidence in, in Australia. Uh, the incidence is about 0.7 per 100,000 in the United States. And here in Queensland, um, the incidence of Merkel's is 1.6 per 100,000 which is uh, the highest in the world, unfortunately. Um, and although it is a rare cancer, the incidence does appear to be rising uh, steeply uh, as seen by um, uh, this graph of this year database. 
It's primarily a disease of, of elderly uh, Caucasian uh, patients. The median age is about 75 to 80. And less than 12% of Merkel cell carcinoma is diagnosed in, in patients under 60. There is a, a male preponderance uh, with a ratio of about 1.4 to 1 versus females. So the, the key risk factors to Merkel cell carcinoma are um, uh, advanced age and immunosuppression. Uh, there are two very distinct etiologies to Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, one is um, uh, exposure to, to UV radiation um, causing genomic damage. And, and, and the other is infection with this uh, virus called the Merkel cell polyoma virus. And just a brief slide about the mechanism of how uh, the virus causes Merkel cell carcinoma. So, so the Merkel's polyoma virus is, is a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus, which um, induces tumor genesis through clonal integration into the host genome and expression of viral oncal proteins. The circular Merkel cell polyoma virus genome consists of a large T antigen and a small T antigen. And uh, a chance truncating mutation in the large T antigen disrupts the helicose domain and renders the virus replication incompetent. The truncated large T antigen then binds to and disables the, the tumor suppressor um, retinal blastoma or RB. This then abrogates the, um, uh, the critical G1S uh, cell cycle checkpoint and mediates this uh, sustained tumor growth. Um, I'm sure Richard in his talk will go into this in, in, in greater depth in terms of the underlying genomics and biology. Uh, so this is a, a summary table of the uh, Merkel's positive versus, uh, so, so the viral positive versus viral negative cancers. And although these two subtypes are indistinguishable histologically and on H and E staining, they're actually quite different genomically. So the viral negative uh, Merkel cell cancers um, are much more genomically unstable. They have a, a much higher uh, tumor mutational burden and they have a characteristic um, um, UV signature uh, on sequencing that, that there is um, uh, abundant C to T transitions. Um, for the viral positive uh, Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, by comparison, these uh, are much more genomically stable, have a lower tumor mutational burden and don't have this UV signature. Um, although both subtypes seem equally responsive to immunotherapy, at least in the advanced disease setting from what we know so far. Um, so this is um, uh, just making the point that in, in Australia, the majority of Merkel cell poly, um, um, carcinoma uh, is induced by UV radiation. So these are predominantly viral negative uh, tumors. Whereas in the Northern hemisphere, um, in the United States and Europe, the majority of Merkel cells is actually caused by the virus with only about 20% being viral negative and, and induced by UV radiation. It's just like courtesy of uh, Richard Scolia from MIA. So just a summary of um, some clinical features of Merkel. So Merkel usually presents as a painless, rapidly growing erythematous or violaceous nodule, predominantly in sun exposed areas of the skin, such as the head, neck or extremities. There are some pictures here of what it might look like. As you can appreciate, you know, it is such a rare cancer and with this sort of appearance is actually quite a number of differential diagnosis. And, 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 and um, you know, if you encountered this in, in, in primary practice, Merkel's is probably not the first thing that comes to mind. And as a result, often it can be diagnosed late or misdiagnosed. But the acronym that's used to describe its characteristics is basically um, the, uh, a list of the vowels, so A-E-I-O-U, A being asymptomatic, uh, as in it's not normally painful. E for expanding rapidly, it's certainly a faster growing aggressive malignancy. I for immunosuppressed, uh, O for older than 50, and, and UV, U for UV exposed sites. So on histology, um, Merkel's is composed of small round blue cells that um, express neuroendocrine markers such as synaptophysin and chromogranin A. Um, so on H&E, it, it looks very similar or is indistinguishable from uh, small cell uh, lung cancer. However, it can be distinguished by through immunohistochemistry classically being positive for CK20 and negative for CK7 and, and TTF1. So 
um, all cancers are, uh, have their prognosis and, and management determined by their staging and, and, and Merkel's is no exception. Uh, this is the latest version of AJCC8 staging for Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, it's quite logically divided into uh, the T and M uh, paradigm. So T for tumor, N for lymph node, and N for metastasis. Basically stage one and two Merkel's is local disease. So where the tumor is confined just to the skin primary, stage one being less than two centimeters and stage two being greater than two centimeters. So very straightforward. Stage 2B further denotes patients uh, as primary tumour uh, invades uh, underlying structures such as bone, muscle, fascia or cartilage. Stage 3 disease denotes nodal involvement, with 3A being pathological nodal involvement, meaning that um, you can't obviously clinically detect nodal involvement, but it's detected microscopically, usually through sentinel lymph node biopsy. Stage three being being macroscopic nodal involvement. And stage four is distant metastatic disease. And this graph just um, bring, takes home that message of just how, how deadly Merkel cell carcinoma actually is. And, and stage for stage, it has a mortality rate that far exceeds that more common skin cancer melanoma, which we, which, um, you know, is often thought in the community of being the deadliest skin cancer. So uh, in purple, you have the five-year survival by stage of melanoma. Uh, and as you can see, for stage one and two melanoma, the five-year survival actually is excellent, over, being over 97% for melanoma. In blue, you have the five-year survival for Merkel cell carcinoma detected by pathological staging. And in green, you have the five-year survival by clinical staging. So the clinically staged patients do do worse because a proportion of them have occult nodal disease that's not been detected. And as you can see, even for stage one disease and stage two Merkel cell carcinoma, the five year survival is really appalling. Um, it's around 50% for local disease and around, only around 30% for stage three disease. So just a brief summary on, on treatment options for local regional disease. Um, so the, the issue with the challenge we've had in Merkel's is, is always that uh, there is really a, a paucity of, of good quality prospective randomized controlled trials because of how rare the cancer is and because often patients also are, are elderly comorbid patients, it's been very difficult to do good quality controlled trials. Uh, so clinical re recommendations are often based on large retrospective studies and small single arm prospective studies and expert opinion. For local regional disease, that is stage one to three disease, this is generally treated with a combination of surgery and or radiotherapy. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, surgery is probably more often used as the primary modality for managing Merkels, whereas here in Australasia, uh, radiotherapy is employed more often. Certainly Merkels is a very radiosensitive disease and, and Gerald, who will um, speak later, may go into this in more detail. Um, but essentially, uh, it's not essential to, when you operate on Merkel's, to have uh, clear or wide margins, especially if functional pasmesis can be compromised, as is often the case in, in head and neck primary cases, because margins can be salvaged by, by radiotherapy. And it's, it's, it's entirely appropriate in some cases to just give definitive radiotherapy, especially in um, cosmetically sensitive areas or in, in comorbid patients that may not tolerate surgery. Um, but despite optimal local regional uh, treatment, the, the key problem with Merkel's is the high risk of death from systemic failure, even for early stage disease. So the promise of immunotherapy. So there's been strong evidence linking the etiology and prognosis of Merkel's to, to cellular immunity for a long time. So the, the first observation is that uh, conditions of chronic uh, T cell immunosuppression, such as HIV or hematological malignancies or solid organ transplant does increase your risk of developing Merkel's by 10 to 30 fold. And there are spontaneous reports of patients who develop Merkel's when you um, withdraw or withhold their immunosuppression, they do get spontaneous regression of the disease. Um, and more direct evidence of a tumor specific immunity uh, is shown by the presence of TILs reported, so tumor infiltrating lymphocytes reported in around 20% of Merkel's cases, with a, certainly a high CD8 cytotoxic T cell count being predictive of survival. 
again, Richard may, may have more to add to this um, in his talk. So targeting uh, the PD-1 to pd one T-cell checkpoint has, has proven to be highly effective for advanced Merkels. Um, and so this, uh, this is a diagram showing the, um, the PD-1, pd one axis. So um, just in brief summary, this is probably, um, as a, a, it's probably the most important uh, advancement in, in, uh, in medical oncology, at least over the last 10 years. And basically works in the principle that your immune system usually is able to, to, to take, take care of and um, most subclinical cancer, um, but um, your immune system has inherent mechanisms to um, stop it from um, basically, you know, sort of becoming activated in an unregulated fashion as in there are intrinsic breaks uh, in your own immune system to stop it from uh, attacking healthy tissue and, and causing autoimmunity. And one of these important uh, checkpoints is the pd one to pd one axis. Um, and if you can have an antibody, so classically the PD-1 is present on T cells and pd one on tumor cells, although the, the truth is much more nuanced than this. But if you can develop an antibody which blocks this pathway, this then reinvigorates your immune system, takes the breaks of your T cells to then recognize and fight the cancer. So prior to 2016, chemotherapy was the standard of care in metastatic Merkels. And although chemotherapy can shrink your cancer, it does have a, a robust rate, a robust response rate in the order of 30 to 50%. Generally, this response is very short lived, on average only around three to five months. And on generally patients only live around uh, an average of 10 months uh, with chemotherapy in the metastatic disease setting. But since then, there's been a number of studies, generally single um, um, phase two studies uh, across various immune checkpoint inhibitors, so PD-1 or pd one inhibitors, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and avalumab. Uh, in total, uh, close to 280 patients now assessed that have shown that immunotherapies are remarkably effective. So response rates, um, and, and by response rate, I mean the chance of the treatment shrinking the tumor by at least 30%, um, response rates being around 40 to 70% when you use immunotherapy upfront as the first treatment in metastatic disease, and 30% when you use it in patients that have already progressed on chemotherapy. But what is truly remarkable is the durability of these responses. Um, so with pembrolizumab, for example, um, you have a medium duration of it, um, of a working of, a, of 17 months with a a two-year survival of, of close to 70%, which is just unheard of in metastatic Merkels um, in the chemotherapy era. And with Ivalumab, which is the drug that's approved in Australia, um, and this is in a, a chemo-resistant setting, so um, a population that traditionally has a very poor prognosis, we now have three-year follow-up data which showing that uh, about a third of the patients are still alive and doing well, which is truly remarkable. And so this is just going through some of the, the studies that I mentioned in detail. So this is the Avalumab study called the Javelin Merkel 200. Um, so it was divided into part A and B. Part A was uh, initially in patients that were heavily pretreated that had progressed on chemotherapy. And part B was in, in what we call first line metastatic patients. So patients that haven't had any treatment uh, once they developed metastatic disease. Um, so the data for part A, which is the chemotherapy pretreated group, is more mature. Um, so this shows what we call the overall response rate. So that is the proportion of people who had a tumor shrinkage of greater than 30%. So there was a 33% response rate and 10% and of the people actually had a complete response. That was the tumor was completely gone. And this is a, a plot really just showing the subgroups of patients that benefited and as you can see, really all groups benefit us, regardless of whether um, you, know, you had visceral disease or not, regardless of whether your tumor had expression of this PDL1 um, um, uh, or not, and regardless of whether you were viral positive or viral negative. Um, regardless of what line of treatment you seem to benefit, although um, as is generally the case in oncology, using the, the therapy earlier when patients are um, are in better shape, does, does have um, um, more efficacy. And this is showing the overall survival uh, using avalumab compared to 
chemotherapy. So chemotherapy in the blue and green line, as you can see, um, it's really quite an abysmal survival curve with almost everyone falling off the curve um, before 10 months. Whereas with um, avalumab, um, there's really a durable response. And we've got data now up to three years now where it really appears to plateau. And this is a, a table summarizing the side effects that you get from avalumab. Um, so there are a number of potential immune-related side effects related to, to do when the immune system gets a bit overactive and atta accidentally attacks your healthy tissue. But the point is that the overall risk of side effects is actually very low. So grade three or greater side effects, meaning you know, clinically significant side effects, only around 11%, which is significantly lower than chemotherapy, showing that this is by and large a well-tolerated treatment, which is very important you know, in a, a population that is um, um, by and large um, uh, elderly. So this is um, just some data with um, uh, the drug pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, and this, this just um, um, really is showing, firstly, that, that most patients respond by the first scan, um, uh, showing that it works fairly rapidly, and also that it's a very durable um, response in, in, in a majority of patients. The blue arrow showing ongoing responses. And um, so even when the drug is stopped, you see um, many patients are still responding. So the data I presented so far is in patients who have metastatic disease, um, but immunotherapy has also been trialed in patients with earlier stage disease in what we call the neoadjuvant setting. So this is prior to surgery. So this is a small study um, using the drug nivolumab, which is another PD-1 inhibitor. And this is enrolling patients that have resectable disease. So these were mostly stage three patients, though there was a handful of stage two and four. And this trial gave these patients just two doses of the immunotherapy in the volumab over four weeks, and then they had surgery at the end of the month. And what they found was that even just with two doses of immunotherapy, they had quite a high response rate when they looked at the pathology after they did the surgery. So about half the patients actually had a complete pathological response, even just after two doses at surgery. And another 15% or so had what's called a major pathological response, which is that there was only less than 10% of viable tumor left. Overall, about 65% of patients had a pretty good response just with two doses. Um, and this is um, showing that, you know, with the overall population at about two years, about 70% of them were still free of Merkel's. But if you had a response to, to immunotherapy, you did remarkably well. So the blue curve here is if you have a pathological complete response to immunotherapy, and the red curve is that if you don't respond, as you can see, the difference in whether you progress at two years is really massive. In fact, at a follow-up of 20 months, not a single patient with a pathological complete response of Merkel's has relapsed. Um, the, the one patient that's dropped off the curve here died of an alternative cause rather than Merkel cell carcinoma. So historically, this is a group of patients that at two years, probably about 50% would relapse. But if you respond to immunotherapy, as you can see, you do remarkably well. And, and neoadjuvant immunotherapy is, is um, you know, really, um, you know, a very exciting uh, way to manage these patients because, as you can see, you can get an early readout of whether the treatment is effective. So this is um, just a summary of the... Um, the NCCN guidelines um, showing what the best standard of care is now in 2020 and, and for metastatic. Um, the first thing to say is that, you know, this is a, a, a rare cancer um, that often requires multidisciplinary input. And ideally all Merkel cell carcinoma patients should be referred to and discussed at a, a tertiary hospital that has one of these uh, multidisciplinary meetings. Um, um, obviously, with any, when he, any cancer, if available, clinical trials are always the preferred means of treatment. Um, but in the absence of that, in terms of systemic therapy, immunotherapy, either with avalumab or pembrolizumab or nivolumab, should be the standard of care. And in, in Australia, avalumab is the only drug that's approved for Merkel cell carcinoma that's funded by the PBS. Um, but for patients who progress on immunotherapy, 
or for whatever reason that are not suitable for immunotherapy, and then uh, chemotherapy still has a role in terms of palliation of symptoms, although it's not a great treatment. So, so as, as I've shown, NTPD1, pdl one based immunotherapy has rapidly displaced chemotherapy and is, is the standard of care now for advanced multiple cell carcinoma because the vastly superior durability of response and the, the better tolerability in terms of less toxicity. Um, Avalimab was FDA approved in the United States in March 2017, being the first drug to, um, to achieve the status of Merkel cell carcinoma. Pembrolizumab followed suit in December. Uh, here in Australia, since May 2019, Avalimab has been on the PDS for us to use. Uh, but this is only in stage four metastatic disease. Um, and the benefit of immunotherapy as an adjuvant treatment in early stage Merkels is still unclear. Um, and this, this is just a graph to uh, reinforce the fact that firstly, um, only about 8% of patients with Merkel cell carcinoma will first present in metastatic disease. The remainder, over 90%, will actually present in local regional disease. So 65% will present with local disease only, and about a quarter will present with nodal disease. And you can see the, the prognosis of these patients. So at, at five years, even with, with stage one disease, you have a 50% chance of dying. Uh, and with stage three disease, um, you have um, really only, you know, a, a, you have a greater than 70% chance of dying. Now, it's important to note that because Merkel's often occurs in, in a re relatively elderly population, um, no doubt some of these patients are dying of comorbid conditions rather than the Merkel cell carcinoma. But even if you follow good quality single institution recurrence data, um, patients with local, so stage one to two disease, still have a 30 to 40% chance of relapsing at two years. And patients with nodal disease have a 50% chance of relapsing. So it's a great unmet need. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's local regional Merkel's is an abysmal prognosis. And we know in other cancers, such as melanoma, for example, where immunotherapy initially showed great efficacy in the metastatic setting, we've managed to bring that into the early stage adjuvant setting where it's shown that it can increase um, cure rates. So, so really, um, you know, this is a great unmet need where there's currently not any therapy. And, and, and this is what we're trying to address um, with the IMAP trial, which is a, a, a trial that we're leading. So this is an Australian cooperative group trial that's funded by the MRFF. Uh, so it's an academic uh, trial looking to enroll patients with stage one to three Merkels um, and randomizing them to six months of immunotherapy versus placebo. Uh, there are a number of stratification factors really to make sure that both arms are balanced in terms of local regional uh, management. But really this trial, we deliberately made it very flexible and very loose in terms of what local regional treatment is allowed, recognizing that the treatment for Merkel's is, is heterogeneous and that um, you, know, you can have a combination of either surgery or radiation. The primary endpoint of this is, is relapse at two years and the number of secondary endpoints. And um, to, for it to be a, uh, uh, a scientifically sound study, this study needs to be randomized against placebo, but we are comforted by the fact that in Australia, at least, um, if you do develop metastatic disease later, you can still access a Velomat in that setting. Um, and this is just a list of the contact details for this trial. So there's a site open uh, in every capital city and, and, and several sites in the bigger capital cities, as well as some regional centers such as Newcastle or Townsville. So we're really hoping that um, you consider this trial for your patients. Um, and this is another slide to um, just to promote another MRFF funded Australian academic trial called the Gotham study uh, led by uh, Shanine Sandu at Peter Mack. And, and this study is leveraging on the fact that firstly, Merkel's is a very radiosensitive disease. And secondly, that being a neuroendocrine cancer, that greater than 50% of Merkel's patients do actually express somatostatin receptors. So this is taking a paradigm that's maybe more familiar to many of you that's using gastrointestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine cancers, where we take eligible patients and do an FDG 
and dotatate PET up front. And for the patients that have significant dotatate uptake or concordant dotatate and FDG uptake, these patients, they can get randomized to either immunotherapy plus lutetium PRT versus uh, immunotherapy um, plus uh, radiotherapy. The patients that, are, that don't express so much in statin analog still get just immunotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, and this is because while immunotherapy works very well, still a significant proportion of patients, you know, up to 50%, won't have durable responses. So we can still certainly improve the game here. So last slide, just in terms of future directions. So I think the future for metastatic Merkels lies in combination therapy. So there's a lot of interest of combining different immune checkpoint inhibitors um, being a chemosensitive disease, chemoimmunotherapy is also an option that's worth exploring. And this is a paradigm that's worked in other cancers like uh, lung and triple negative breast cancer. Obviously, we can combine it with radiotherapy and PRT, as I've just mentioned in the Gotham trial. Um, being a cutaneous disease, direct intralesional therapies is also um, of great interest. And that uh, could be, for example, with oncolytic viral treatments like TVAC and Cavatac or with agents that stimulate your innate immune system, such as toll-like receptor agonists and sting agonists. And finally, prob prob probably what will change the outcomes for the most number of patients is bringing an effective treatment into an earlier stage. So investigating immunotherapy in the adjuvant, the neoadjuvant um, setting with the IMAP trial. Um, that's the, uh, the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Wen. It's, um, it's amazing the advances that have um, come along for Merkel cell, uh, which was a cancer sort of, I know, about 15 years ago. There were not very many options. So um, it's fabulous to see how much we've uh, progressed and how much work's going into looking after Merkel cell patients. So our next speaker. I'm sorry, sorry Wen. Was there something? Have I uh, unshared my screen? Just having a little bit of a glitch here. Hopefully no, you're still not. on there. Oh, that's it. Fabulous. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Professor Joel. Sorry, Professor Gerald Fogarty. Um, and <laughs> as I said, he's the Director of Radiation Oncology at the MARTA. And he's going to present pathways in radiation therapy. Thanks, Great. Gerald. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope I get the right thing here. Here we go. Great. So hopefully you can see that there. This should be yes. a fairly bland screen of. Uh, Pathways and radiation therapy. I was trying to get the full the um, full show here. There you go. Great. So, so my, my role is to talk about radiation therapy and the pathways that people take in order to get treatment here in Australia. So uh, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for the introduction and to be part of this great panel. So, so a bit of a preamble. Uh, went or, or already been through some of this. Uh, it's good to remember that Merkel was only really described in 1972. So there are people still out there practicing medicine uh, who who got educated uh, around this time. Who who this would not have been addressed in the undergraduate uh, curriculum. So it's uh, quite interesting to know that there are people out there who may not have heard of Merkel. The incidence is rising, as Wen said. Many still think of of, Mer of Merkel as melanoma. And there are some similarities. It is a skin cancer. Uh, the causation can be sun-related. It spreads early. There's a high mortality rate. So it's not your usual slow-burning neuroendocrine tumour, but it is different from melanoma. First of all, it is rarer. Uh, and that's why it's hard to get prospective trials done on time because we really need to have a lot of uh, institutions combining in order to get the numbers uh, onto the arms of a trial in order to show significant differences between the treatment arms. Australia has got a very good record of uh, doing trials in Merkel, particularly in Queensland, under Mike Paulson, a radiation oncologist up there. Um, another reason why it's hard to do trials is because the population that gets Merkel is older than that of melanoma, and oftentimes they're immunosuppressed as well. So it's hard to push 
the treatment envelope. So some of our oncology treatments are very aggressive uh, and you do need to have patients who are fit enough to take the treatment, but oftentimes they are not. And, uh, and a more palliative approach is taken uh, in order to treat symptoms rather than to go for cure, because we know that some of the patients would not survive the treatment um, for this disease, let alone survive and then get some benefit out of the treatment. It is sensitive to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, because radiotherapy needs a certain dose in order to be effective. Uh, there's really no role for wide local excision. Uh, in fact, doing wide local excision can delay time for therapy. So when people are referred to as someone with Merkel, they think it's melanoma, they do a wide local excision, it takes a while for the, uh, for the uh, wound to heal. That time could be a time when the, when the Merkel can spread rapidly through the body and uh, that can actually be uh, a, a, a negative for overall survival time. So there's a limited role of sentinel node biopsy, it certainly helps us radiation oncologists to guide radiation field placement, particularly in the head and neck sites where, where we want to cover all the possible lymph node drainage um, and it's also important for earning immunotherapy uh, in some countries and some trials if you've got a positive sentinel node. So there are reasons to do sentinel node biopsy but Protestant, the evidence is not as strong as in melanoma. So this is just a, this is just a graphic to show what we're talking about here. This is a Merkel cell carcinoma on the hand of a, of a male patient. You can see this has got an active crater, uh, it's bleeding. Uh, this, uh, if you, if you, in fact, if you press this, sounds a bit this sounds a bit gross, but it actually spurted blood. Um, so this is a rapidly growing uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, lesion. And, and this was treated by a colleague of mine, Angela Hong, who's a radiation oncologist at the Melanoma Institute of Australia with myself. So only radiotherapy is usually given in fractions. We usually give it in fractions in order to make sure that normal tissue has time to repair between the treatments. And after only two fractions of a plan 30, already this ulcer has closed over. So it's only after one 30th of the treatment, uh, sorry, one 15th of the treatment, uh, already there's been some response. And then 10 weeks after the whole treatment, you can see that this is completely back to normal. So there's absolutely no sign, there's no surgery being used here, no chemotherapy. This is only radiotherapy. So this is a radiation responsive tumor. This would not happen with melanoma. And so we, you can see with this that we use radiotherapy a lot in Australia for Merkel because it can control things very easily and lead to tissue conservation. Anywhere where we use radiotherapy, it's all about tissue conservation as compared to surgery. So this, this, uh, this contrasts with this case, which was written up in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very prestigious medical journal. This is a case from Spain. This lady was, uh, an 84 year old lady was diagnosed with a Merkel cell carcinoma on, on her finger here. Um, she had a sentinel load biopsy in, and she was proven to have a cell node biopsy in the axilla. So she was treated with, this is in Italy, uh, sorry, in Spain. Um, uh, she was treated with amputation of this finger and then with an axillary dissection. So we wouldn't do that in Australia. Uh, we would treat this with localized radiotherapy if anything. Actually, and with a positive cell node, you'd probably get immunotherapy first, probably wouldn't need any radiotherapy locally. And we would, with a positive sentinel load, would lead to now having uh, immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, before the immunotherapy era, she would have had some low dose radiotherapy to her axilla. The problem with doing the surgery is she loses this finger. And in the axilla with surgery, there's a risk of further complications with lymphedema uh, and nerve problems as well. So, you know, now this is in a, the most, one of the most prestigious journals you can ever publish in. Uh, this was sort of written up as a great way of treating Merkel cell carcinoma. But uh, because there's been no randomized trials on this, we can't actually say to them, you treated her wrong or, or you know, that she could have been treated better because we just don't have the evidence. That's why it's so important to get the evidence to complete the prospective randomized trials so that we can really inform our colleagues about the, uh, the ways we can treat people with just as good as oncological outcome, but without the morbidity of losing bits of anatomy. The roles of therapy, they were evolving. We know that the pattern of spread of Merkel is 50% go to regional lymph nodes in the first instance, 
The other 50 bypass them and go straight to distant. So in that recurrence is usually in the first year. Uh, initially in Australia, uh, uh, this has been a very much radiotherapy disease. I think the radiation colleges have done a good job in convincing the community based on some good phase two trials done by Mike Paulson in Brisbane that, uh, that, uh, that radiotherapy is needed. And the, the whole idea in Australia, for most people to treat vocal is to the idea of getting quickly to radiotherapy. And what we do with radiotherapy is we cover radiotherapy as a local treatment and we cover the local site and the draining regional lymph nodes with the treatment volumes and they need a good dose of radiotherapy, 50 grain, 25 fractions, that's 25 visits to a radiotherapy department in order to cover the local and regional stations. That's the normal script that one would, one would have for a Merkel cell carcinoma. This is unlike in the US. Uh, in the US, this is very much a surgical disease. Part of the reason for that is because radiation oncologists in general in the US are not engaged in skin cancer for reasons that are more historical than anything. Uh, and there's also further difficulty in getting international trials, trials going, particularly involving radiotherapy, because uh, if you, if, if a big player like the States doesn't do radiotherapy, then uh, how are you going to convince the rest of the world that, that we need to do international trials with radiotherapy in, in, in some of the arms? So the diagnosis went, went over that very well. There is a blood marker that's used also in the States. We don't use that here. Uh, part of the fact we don't use it here is because the evidence is not great. And part of the reason for that is because this is so rare and, and trials really need to be done in this space. So with the staging, PET makes a big impact because with PET, we can find early distant disease. We can find distant disease early and therefore we can get people onto immunotherapy earlier when they're fitter, they have less disease bulk uh, and they can have a much better response. However, in the US, PET is very expensive. We're very lucky here in, in Australia to have PET that's relatively inexpensive. And so therefore it's once again, hard to do trials in uh, uh, the world when you can't get a PET scan in the US uh, on a trial, because usually with trials, we try to give people very cheap treatments or even free treatments. And the, 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 we, we screen for distant disease with uh, CT scan. And uh, CT scans are definitely not as uh, um, uh, sensitive as the PET scans. So we're lucky to have PET in Australia. The Amigos group, of which I'm the chair, uh, we are trying to get free PETs from the government. The government is very open to this, and I think that will go through. Melanoma gets free pets, why not Merkel, which, is, which has even a, a higher mortality rate uh, per case. So uh, uh, we are trying to get free, uh, free pets for Merkel cell patients, both for staging at the beginning and also for surveillance. So treatment, we know, we know the, the, the changing role of systemic therapies, now immunotherapy stage four, very effective, but we still need multidisciplinary care. And we know that there could be some uh, interaction or some synergy between radiotherapy plus immunotherapy, which needs to be shown in this disease. Uh, and so that's why we need to have specialists that talk to each other so that people can quickly go from surgery to radiotherapy to medical, to, to medical oncology in that combination or other combinations in order to get best cure rates. So pathways, how do people with Merkel cell carcinoma find help? Well, personally, this is a personal opinion. I think there are patients who may be not diagnosed. Uh, this is a very hard, thing to measure. What happens is they go to their doctor, they're already patients who are older, they already suffer from skin cancers, they go to their local doctor or to their dermatologist or skin cancer GP, and another, and a pink lesion is found. And this is just burnt off, you know, because it looks like another BCC or another SCC. And then later on, they have metastatic disease of unknown primary. And uh, this, could be, this could be in their liver or their brain or whatever. And it's never been reported as Merkel cell carcinoma. And I think what we need to do is we need to really educate the uh, primary care and uh, so that they really understand that Merkel cell carcinoma is a real possibility of diagnosis in this country and it's increasing so that people do get the proper care. With the, uh, if the histopathology, particularly of a, of a metastatic um, deposit, this can be described as small cell lung cancer because this is exactly what it looks like. Um, and so people can say, well, this person died of metastatic small cell lung cancer without a primary being found in the lungs. Some doctors are unaware of the importance of early care. And uh, this is one of the initiatives that we're doing in our group of Amigos is trying to get information about uh, Merkel cell carcinoma on a pathology report. So if someone, if a histopathologist writes on a report, this is Merkel cell carcinoma, we can have a little disclaimer saying, this is an important cancer. This person 
would benefit from a multidisciplinary opinion, uh, we suggest that you get this person to a multidisciplinary skin uh, uh, group as soon as possible in order to get early best care. So in Australia, skin cancer is so common that it's looked after much of the time very well by community primary care and multidisciplinary approaches in skin cancer are not usual like they are in breast and brain and lung. And so there can be a delay sometime for complex skin cancers to get to a multidisciplinary approach. Um, sometimes also we, have, we get patients uh, who can't believe the fuss their relatives go on with. They might get a cancer diagnosis of Merkel cell carcinoma. This is an older person. Their children or their grandchildren get onto the web. They look up the Merkel cell carcinoma. They find, wow, this is really bad. You've got to get straight away to a multidisciplinary clinic. The patients can even delay themselves saying, look, this is just a little pink lump I had on my arm or my leg or my face, what, what's, what's the problem? So there certainly is a need for patient advocacy in this space. And uh, we've had great success with, with combining with Merck in order to get Avelumab on the, on, the, on the PBS, which has been a real boon for, for, for many people who are involved with Amigos. Uh, and so we do need to sort of help the community uh, understand that this is, a, this is a cancer that needs to be taken seriously. So there are some trials, one went, went through this very clearly. There's the IMAT trial, which he's the principal investigator of, there's the Gosling trial, which Shanina's running. Uh, but we really do need to help accrue to these trials. And we, this will help us to stop 84 year olds losing fingers and auxiliary contents. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna have a slide about the Amigos at the end, which will help explain those trials a little bit more, although Wen has done a very good job in doing that. So that's my, that's my presentation. Um, any questions about radiotherapy in, in Merkel or Pathways, we're happy to take them at the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gerald. That was um, very informative and look forward to hearing more about the Amigos in the um, session three, three along. So our next presenter is uh, Dr. Richard Tottle and he is going to talk to us about genomics, which I think is an area that a lot of us um, need to get a lot more information about. And it's a very exciting um, dimension of um, a lot of cancers. So thanks very much, Richard. Thanks, Meredith. I presume my slides are presenting correctly. Looking good, Richard. All good, thank you. Okay, so my job today was to talk about genomics. Um, I'm going to extend that a little bit to talking about the virus um, that Wen spoke about previously, the Merkel cell polyoma virus, and also just linking that back to the immunology um, because the genetics of this disease and the virus are actually very important um, in uh, determining the immune response in patients. Um, I guess just to note that I got into working on this disease and became interested about six years ago, and that came about through two mechanisms, I guess. Um, firstly, uh, the genetics. So I was actually studying a different or another entity called cancer of unknown primary, which actually Gerald touched on. And I found a, a, a Merkel cell carcinoma amongst a patient cohort, um, but only diagnosed through the genomics. Um, the genomic profile of this tumor is quite distinct. And, um, and we can use that to, um, we can use genomics as a diagnostic in that context. Um, and also my wife's uncle actually had a Merkel cell carcinoma. It was around about the same time. And fortunately, he's had a very good response to radiotherapy and um, he's still um, very much alive and well at, um, to this day. So a, a good ending there. Okay, so, so I guess um, firstly to start, I mean, cancer is a genetic disease. It's caused by mutations um, that are either pre-existing um, in the germline of a, of a patient, that is the gene, the DNA that's inherited from um, their patient, their parents. Um, and I guess, and most people have heard of hereditary forms of cancer or probably know someone who may be affected. And so a faulty gene can give rise to hereditary cancer. It's about five to 10% of all cancers are associated with some form of hereditary cancer. And then we see family clusters as well, which may not be related to a single gene, but perhaps uh, um, the, the contribution of many genes um, giving rise to family clusters um, and perhaps caused by what we call polygenic effects. Most cancers are caused by um, sporadic, uh, what we call sporadic disease and spontaneous mutations that arise in cancer genes over time. 
um, we acquire, we're all acquiring mutations as we age. Um, this is just the result of um, the fact that every time your cells divide, they need to replicate their genome and there can be mistakes made. And then we've got other uh, mutagens that can cause mutations in, in genes as well, or the DNA. Um, and this includes well-known carcinogens in, in tobacco smoke or exposure to radiation such as um, UV sunlight. Of course, oops, of course, we've also got a significant fraction of cases um, caused by viruses. And many of these um, viruses um, involve the transmission of genes actually into um, the, uh, the genome of the, of the host or the patient. Um, and these genes are not necessarily designed to cause cancer, but it's an un, unfortunate consequence um, that those genes, which are normally there for replicating the virus, um, can, can actually affect genes within the cell and, and cause that uh, tumor genesis to occur. So uh, I think it was Wen that spoke about some of these clinical features of Merkel cell carcinoma that gives us clues as to, to the etiology or what causes um, this disease. And I've just highlighted two things here, immune suppression and UV exposure. So on the basis of this a strong association with immune suppression, um, two scientists formed a hypothesis that perhaps there was an infectious agent involved um, with causing this cancer. So these, these two scientists here is Yuan Cheng and Patrick Moore, they're actually a husband and wife team um, who work together that actually discovered two different um, uh, viruses to, that cause cancer, the Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus and also the Merkel cell polyoma virus. Um, so the Merkel cell polyoma virus um, is, a, is, is, a, is a virus that's, um, that's uh, it's a DNA virus, very different to the COVID-19 virus that's affecting us all um, today. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's closely related to another virus called SV40, which has been very well studied um, and, and causes cancers in mice. It was thought for many, many years that SV40 also caused cancers in people, um, but this has pretty much been shown not to be the case. So the, the really um, interesting thing about the Merkel cell polyoma virus is that the infection is actually quite common in the, in the population. So a very few people actually develop Merkel cell carcinoma who are infected by this virus. So we know people are being infected because they have antibodies in the blood um, that are specific to the virus or viral proteins, um, or very specifically the Merkel cell polyoma virus proteins. Um, so by the age of 50, um, it's thought that up to 80% of the population um, would be infected. I'll show you evidence of an infection. It's likely we, we can contract this virus um, in early childhood, perhaps playing in the sand pit with our friends. Um, it's probably part of the normal skin flora and does no harm at all in most, in most um, circumstances. And it's probably shed from our skin as well. And this is how we transmit it. Um, it's innocuous and asymptomatic. There's no, no evidence of ill of health with, um, with infection with the virus. Um, there's, there's no viremia stage, as, as, as they say. So when touched on the genomics of, of the virus itself, it's a small, it's actually got a very small genome. The coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus, actually six times as large as this. Um, this is a circular genome and it encodes um, a, a number of different proteins. Um, this early region here encodes proteins involved with um, the viral replication and the, the late region codes for these um, viral capsid proteins, um, which encase the viral DNA. And so, as we mentioned as well, there's the large T and small T antigen. These are the potent oncogenes um, harbored by this virus. And the large T antigen um, binds to this retinoblastoma protein um, causing, um, which is involved with cell cycle progression. And so if you bind, the, when the large T antigen binds to RB, you get cell cycle progression and it causes the cells to proliferate. The small, the small T antigen is also quite potent. In fact, it's maybe more potent than the large T antigen although both are required for tumor genesis. And this affects other hallmarks such as um, cell growth uh, um, of the cancer cells. So how does this, how does this, um, how does, what is the, the route to pathogenesis? Well, we're probably likely infected during early childhood, as I mentioned, perhaps with immunosuppression, the virus gets reactivated, or it's just a spontaneous thing that happens. One interesting thing that needs to happen with this um, to become oncogenic, though it needs to be incorporated into the genome of the host cell. This doesn't normally happen. This, the virus normally exists outside of um, the nucleus of the cell um, and doesn't get, become incorporated. 
It then needs to acquire a mutation that takes out this helicase domain, um, which is important for viral replication. It's thought that if that didn't happen, then the virus would actually start trying to replicate itself. And that causes lots of DNA damage and the cell um, would apoptose from, from the result of that. Perhaps with the, the, the collaboration between um, the large and small T antigen, um, this is enough to start causing early stages of tumor genesis, but it's highly likely um, that other genetic events also happen in the, in the genome of the viral positive tumors um, to, to cause full-blown disease and for these things to become malignant. Okay, so as Wen mentioned, um, the uh, prevalence of viral positive disease in the Northern Hemisphere is around 80%. Um, and it was thought for a few years that all, vir all Merkel cell carcinomas were viral positive, um, but we know that's not, the tr that's not true now. Um, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, early studies suggested it was the same as the Northern Hemisphere, but um, subsequently another a number of other studies have shown that it's probably around 20 to 25%. It's, it's probably likely that we have the same proportion or the same amount of viral positive disease in Australia. It's just that we've got a lot more viral negative disease and that increases the total number of, of cases that we experience in, um, in Australia. So I'm just going to step back before I start talking about the genome um, in more detail to talk about DNA. So DNA is, the, of course, the genetic blueprint of the cell. It's a four-base code um, or four-letter code, A, C, G, and T. Oops. And um, one genome is essentially three billion letters. So that's quite, that's quite a bit of information packed into every cell. In fact, you've got two copies of the genome. One, from, one comes from your mother and one from your father. Um, and these packed into 23 um, chromosome or 22 autosomes and, and uh, in, in duplicate and then two sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. So the human genome, um, well, it has around 30,000 genes. It's only about 3% of the entire genome. Um, so what does the rest of it do? Well, it's probably involved with regulation, but it's also somewhat of an artifact of evolution um, that we've got all this extra DNA in there. Um, there's only about 700 of the 30,000 genes that have been really well characterized in cancer. Um, so it shows that not all genes are involved with cancer. It's only a very select um, number of those. So sequencing a human genome, what do we mean by that? Well, we really mean just decoding it. So what do we, how do we determine the code of this ACGT um, sequence? Um, and to do this, uh, we, could, we can't really do this using uh, a microscope because DNA is very small. This is just a picture taken from an um, electron microscope. It's really DNA is like a very long strand. It's actually like two strands coiled around each other, forming that nice do double helix structure. Um, even when we're using EM electron microscope, you can see that you can't really see the, the finer resolution that you might need to decode the genome. So what we have to do is resort to using molecular biology. And this chap here is Fred Sanger. He invented um, Sanger sequencing, um, which was really became the predominant um, uh, form of DNA sequencing. Back in the 70s, the, though he was using autoradiography and he could sequence up to 100 to 1,000 perhaps bases a day um, using this method. Um, and perhaps at this time, he could do a whole PhD in just sequencing one gene. So in the, in the 90s, um, this technology was improved with the use of fluorescence chemistry and we can improve the throughput um, and perhaps taking this to um, a million days of bases per day. And really this was the foundation uh, technology that was used to sequence the first draft of the human genome, which was published in 2000. Now we've got this technology called next generation sequencing, um, really uh, miniaturizing uh, the sequencing um, using better fluidics, um, better chemistry, um, and, and high computing power, um, we can generate now up to two trillion bases a day of sequence data. And that's only just off a single instrument. Um, so uh, the capacity we have now with sequencing, we can sequence tens or hundreds of genomes a day um, without too much effort. Okay, so just, I guess, uh, just a cartoon here just to show you what we're exactly doing. Um, this is using next generation sequencing, actually sequencing lots of fragments um, from the same sample. We need redundancy in sequencing um, the same bit of DNA because there is a bit of an error profile in this technology. So you want to see the same thing more than once. Um, this is the reference. This is just a cartoon of the reference of chromosome one here. And say there's a reference of, this is the normal base that's um, in this particular gene sequence, A, and then it's changed to a C. And you can see that you've got a a C in many of these fragments. 
And this is what we call a point mutation. It's a single base mutation. And this is actually in some circumstances enough to cause um, uh, an aberration in a gene and change its function. We can also see um, uh, other events, small events called um, insertions, deletions, maybe a, a, a removal of a couple of bases. We can see much larger events of um, large gene deletion events, and therefore you don't see any, any sequence covering particular regions called as a homozygous deletion. This is where both copies from both the mother and the father have been taken out in that cell. Um, and then a hemizygous deletion is just one copy is gone or maybe a gain where you have duplication of a gene. This happens quite frequently with oncogenes um, where you need to see increased expression of that gene. The, the tumor might, might acquire extra copies to drive that process. Um, Breakpoints, fusions are very common in cancer as well. And um, these are often also oncogenic, um, driving a, a tumor, um, driving a particular pathway within a cancer cell. And of course, we can also detect non-human sequence like viral DNA. So this is a very complicated looking picture. And I just wanted to simplify it a bit for you. I guess the take home picture is here to look at the difference between a viral positive Merkel cell carcinoma and a viral negative Merkel cell carcinoma. And you can clearly see that there are some differences here. This is a lot more busy um, than, than in the viral negative than the viral positive as when mentioned that um, there's a lot more DNA damage going on in viral negative tumors. So this is what we call a circos plot, and we have the chromosomes all around the outside here. So this is just to, just to show us the map or the 30,000 feet view really of the genome. And so we're squeezing in here information for 30 or 3 billion bases. Um, so you can see things are pretty small. Um, then we have the point mutations. And as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot more mutations in the viral negative tumors and the viral positive tumors. Um, amplification events. So there's a segmental amplifications and within that, you might see amplification of a gene. You can see a very focal amplification event here, and this might be a, a specific oncogene that's important for driving this tumor. Deletion events, similar structural alteration, large structural alterations, and then we've got these rearrangements that are all shown in the middle here. Okay, so this is a study we published back in 2015. And it's really just, I'm just showing you here to, so, to, to say that, you know, we've looked at many different camp, many um, different individuals with Merkel cell carcinoma to sort of show that pattern that you have um, commonality of, of much of many more mutations in the viral negative tumors and viral positive tumors. Um, this, this little map here of this, of this man is to show um, where all these tumors arose from. And you can see that many of these viral negative tumors shown in gray arise in more sun exposed regions. So what's causing all these mutations um, in the viral negative tumors? Well, as it's been explained previously that um, sun exposure is um, the prime candidate here. So sun exposure, principally through ultraviolet light, the short wavelength light um, and the UVB, UVA spectrum causes a lot of DNA damage. It's really uh, changing the chemical structure of the DNA. And in, in the cells are very good at actually removing this damage quite quickly. Um, and, or if the damage is kind of irreparable, then the cells will, um, will self-destruct essentially. And that's what you get when you, go, when you become sunburnt, it's your cells basically going into crisis and, 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 and dying, and then you might peel. Um, so this, the, the result of these mutations um, causes a very distinct signature. Um, and this, this signature is, is shown here, and you see a lot of the C to T, what we call C to T transitions. And that often happens when you've got two Cs right next to each other. So this is called a dipyrimidine change. And just to give you another example of a, muta a well-known mutational signature, this is a signature four, which is associated with smoking. You can see smoking damage or the carcinogens in smoke causes a very distinct mutational signature. Both of these signatures are actually quite useful diagnostically when we're doing DNA sequencing of patient samples. So we look at the genes now that are mutated in viral negative and viral positive. Clearly there's a lot more going on the viral negative tumors. Um, all viral negative tumors have RB1 mutations. Um, and incidentally, RB1 is the target of the large tension of the Merkel cell polyomavirus. So we're effectively seeing here a convergence on the same pathway. And perhaps that says something about why these tumors look so similar to each other. We've got another, a, a lot of other mutations in cancer genes. And I won't go through these in great detail. Um, some of these genes are 
I guess, potential targets of, of current therapeutics, but it's been quite disappointing in terms of how um, Merkel cell carcinomas have responded to targeted therapies. And I think really been eclipsed by the use now of, of, um, of immunotherapy being the, the primary, um, primary choice, but perhaps targeted therapies could play a role in the future um, it, with, it, with resistance to, um, to immunotherapy, or perhaps they could be used in combination. So I'm just closing on the last part here on why is, why is Merkel cell carcinoma so immunogenic? Um, so we know, as we mentioned, immunosuppression um, is, a, is a risk factor for Merkel cell carcinoma, um, and patients tend to also have a worse survival. Um, we have also this concept of age-related immunosenescence. So as patients um, age, then the immune system um, becomes less effective, especially the adaptive immune system. Um, so most of our Merkel cell patients are, are over 70 years of age. Um, so that could be playing a factor. Um, spontaneous regression, um, and uh, the, especially after cessation of immunosuppression, we also get this phenomenon of cancers of unknown primary. Um, and that's probably where you get a spontaneous regression of the primary tumour and, and the metastatic tumours acquired what needs to um, develop for resistance um, to a vague immune system. And then these um, high T cell infiltration into the tumours as well, patients tend to have a better survival overall, even with uh, more, I guess, conventional therapies uh, before the introduction of immunotherapies, they tended to have a better survival and they had lots of immune cells in the tumour. And then we get, um, of course, this... Um, very high response rate to immune checkpoint inhibition using anti pd one anti-PD-1. So the, the evidence is, is very high that this is an immunogenic tumour. Um, but what, what, why is that so? Well, you might think, well, that's probably obvious that you've got an infectious agent like a Mercosur polyoma virus. And that's true that the immune system is probably seeing that virus and, and it's being incorporated into the cell and, and therefore the immune system is doing its job and killing those infected cells like it would do with other infections. So we just take a closer look, I guess, at what's happening at the cellular level, because this tells us something about why the viral negative tumors also have such a high immune response. And so what's going on in the cell is that the cell is processing proteins all the time, and then it loads them up onto this structure called a, multi, a major histocompatibility complex, and then presents that on the outside of the cell. And what, it, what happens then is that T cells, this part of the adaptive immune system through the T cell receptor, can then bind and it surveys the outside of the cell and it sees whether or not that that peptide that's bound within the MHC is actually um, foreign or is it part of the, of the patient's own um, makeup. And so if this was to happen with a virus, it'll present um, viral uh, a peptide or a small piece of protein on the outside of the cell that's belonging to the virus, and the T cell will recognize that and then do its job and kill the cell. With, with viral negative disease, what we see is that if you get a mutation in a gene and then that translates into a protein um, with that mutation, that then looks foreign to the immune system, to the patient's immune system. So in a similar way or analogous way, this mutant protein is being presented on the outside of the cell and that can also be recognized by, by the T cells. And the larger the number of mutations, the more chance that this is going to happen. And therefore, um, in, in the context of other diseases like lung cancer, um, it's known that a high mutation load is actually a good thing in terms of likely response to immunotherapy. So in terms of resistance, so you're thinking why, why then if this is such this mechanism exists, why does the immune system, don't, why doesn't it eradicate the cancer? Well, it has, uh, cancers are very crafty in the way that they can downregulate um, different proteins. And so I'm just showing you here some immunistic chemistry stain of the MHC club uh, complex being downregulated um, in some tumors. So it's very highly expressed here and then downregulated. We can also see mutations arising in MHC genes um, and this other, pro this other gene here called B2M that's beta microglobulin. So we see mutations um, in both of these um, which can affect um, the immune response and cause immune evasion. So it's when, and, and Gerald's also mentioned that um, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1 therapies are so good um, at, at treating this disease because often these tumors will overexpress pd one pd one it binds to PD-1 on the T cells and makes them um, become uh, less effective in attacking the tumor and just block that. Then these T cells can be reactivated and um, can 
um, and, and then it therefore um, do their job at killing the cancer cells. So this is just a, a stain that we've done of one of the, um, one of the patient samples that we've, we've analyzed and you can see very high PDL1 expression um, uh, within the tumor here. These are all tumor cells on the side. This is all normal stroma which surrounds the tumor and it's like almost like a wall that it sets up um, blocking um, the T cells or, or, or um, uh, making them less effective. Um, and here we've got lots of T cells that are invading into the tumor. These are these yellow dots here, um, different types of T cells invading into the tumor. In fact, a very interesting story that I won't share with you today, but um, uh, occasionally these other types of T cells, what we call unconventional T cells can be important um, in some of these tumors as well, which um, are likely to be seeing the tumors through a completely different mechanism. Anyway, that's a story for another day. So just in summary, um, two distinct subtypes of Merkel cell carcinoma, um, the viral positive, low mutation load, predominantly virally driven, the viral negative, high mutation load, and many gene drivers. Um, and these, uh, the viral negative, of course, are more common in Australia, um, owing to our uh, exposure to the UV light. Um, both subtypes acquire mutations in genes um, that cause the hallmarks of cancer. The polyomavirus has its T antigens driving that. Um, but the viral negative, we have in UV induced mutations in the key oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Um, and the Merkel cell carcinomas are very immunogenic and they're highly responsive to immunotherapy. And this is because the immune system sees both of these um, tumors as being foreign, um, either because of the virus or these neoantigens caused by mutations. Um, and of course, the escape mechanisms, one of the primary escape mechanisms the tumor has is expression of pd one And of course, we can now target that using the immunotherapies. So I'll just conclude there and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Richard. I'm sure there'll be questions that we can um, have answered very shortly. So thanks very much for that. It was um, fabulous. So our next speaker is Jonathan Pincus. And we are so pleased that Jonathan can join us and will talk to us about um, his experience with Merkel cell carcinoma. So thank you so much, Jonathan, and we're good to go. Good, thank you, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yes, I'm the chair of the Merkel cell patient advocacy group um, of uh, the Amigos have set up. And I'll be talking about patient experience. Ours is an advocacy group rather than a <coughs> support group. And if you go to the next slide, um, slide number two, please. Thanks. Um, there are, as explained, aren't very many Merkel cell patients in Australia, and they're scattered all over the place, especially in the northern parts of the country. And so we have developed a, an advocacy group. Its main success so far has, as Gerald mentioned, uh, helping convince the government to put a uh, volume up on the PBS uh, for Merkel cell patients with uh, metastatic disease. It was a very joyous occasion for me to go to Canberra to see that uh, announcement made on 1st of July, 1st of April, I should say, last year. It wasn't April Fools at all because the Prime Minister and the Health Minister of Health were announcing something marvellous for us. And as Gerald has mentioned, we're still pushing hard to get free PET scans the same way as melanoma. Now I'm going to talk not about patients' experience in general. I've uh, listened to a number of patients tell their stories, but I'm not really going to try to summarise. Instead, I'm going to talk about my own story. Stories I've heard from others include stories from clinicians, some of them, as Gerald has, has indicated, are rather miserable. <laughs> so I'll talk about my own. Next slide, please. Um, when I was first diagnosed in early 2014, um, 
I found a lump under my skin. I had a very full beard. I hardly have had any reason to press my chin. Uh, after a needle biopsy uh, and uh, the excision, we had this uh, struggle to decide what it was and whether it was small cell carcinoma or no, it was Merkel. But it was stage 3A at that point with unknown primary. I had a PET scan at the time and nothing else showed up in the PET scan. So I was extremely, un extremely happy. Let me just talk a little bit about my psychology at the time. I found I couldn't stop thinking about the disease. It was a waste of time, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. I didn't go into denial or anger or negotiation, but I felt that the universe was sending me a signal, great importance that other people didn't know. I found it difficult at a concert at Adelaide, not standing up and shouting out, I know something about the universe that you people don't know. I was slightly crazy. I had to damp down on my feelings uh, and especially I couldn't uh, allow myself to get very excited about anything. I had to leave movies when it got too exciting, even left a uh, musical event because the songs got rather miserable. I couldn't even go to romantic, funny movies, which I love, but I just couldn't enjoy it. My brother, who's a GP for many years, came down to stay with me to see how I was. And at the end of it, he said he expected that I would be in a very bad psychological state, but he found me calm and well-centered. Little did he know. Next slide, please. Um, I soon found out that MCC was, was very aggressive. In fact, the first surgeon who took out the lymph node under my chin told me not to look up Dr. Google because I'd be too frightened. Well, of course, that <laughs> frightened me just as well as looking up Dr. Google. I was very lucky that I had a niece who was a medical scientist. She accompanied me to the oncology uh, meetings and also pressed hard about immunotherapy. This was early in 2014. And I couldn't get access to it, but she kept on mentioning it and gave me a bit of comfort that there might be something that uh, ultimately that might help me. Flinders Hospital, where I was going, had a multidisciplinary team, but via my scientific niece, I was also able to contact Peter McCallum in Melbourne, and uh, they acted as a second. Uh, multidisciplinary team. And so I had uh, advice from two teams. I actually phoned up other people in Australia who are experts to get advice. So I had more than one lot of advice. My on primary oncologist was perfectly happy for me to take advice elsewhere. They all strongly recommended radiotherapy. This stage, I was concerned that I was going to die and pretty soon. So I spent a lot of time preparing myself and my affairs so that if I were to die reasonably quickly, my wife would find everything financially and otherwise in good, good shape. And I took our daughter through a file that I had in my filing cabinet called, called In Case of Death. I determined to keep myself as busy as possible. I continued to work both paid and unpaid and I exercised like mad, bicycling three or four times a week, going to old folks gym, singing and gardening. <clears throat> Next slide, please. I started radiotherapy after uh, a bit of a delay because uh, the facility was too crowded, which I learned later on could have been de detrimental to me, but I suspect it wasn't actually. I found it extraordinarily challenging. Uh, first thing that happened was I threatened to lose some of my teeth. But the trauma, trauma dentist at the hospital had to see which ones should be extracted before radiotherapy. And fortunately, in my case, there were none. The radiotherapist was very careful to explain what the side effects would be, but I just didn't, they caught me unaware. I, the discomfort, the lassitude and the pain grew and grew and grew. 
the first time for many, many decades, I had to take pills to get to sleep. Main thing was to struggle to eat. It was very, became very painful to swallow. And what I was eating was wet cardboard. That's what it tasted and felt like. My darling wife would cook what I could eat and then I'd spray xylocaine and antiseptic down my, my antiseptic down my throat and take about an hour to eat a meal. I managed ultimately to eat my meals through a thick straw. With the aid of dietitian and a lot of aid from my wife, I managed to maintain my health, my, my weight, uh, but I had to give up exercise and work. And I nearly tried to get I tried to get out of radiotherapy. Uh, Gerald has mentioned 50 units over 25 sessions. I was about 48 units and it was really, really getting me down. I was having tremendous difficulty. So I said to my radiotherapist, the little extra that you're going to get from protection from this disease is going to be matched by a huge amount of disadvantage to me. Trade-off doesn't seem worth it, so I think I'll quit. However, she was able to convince me to continue uh, the course. Next slide, please. Um, after the radiotherapy, as usual, nothing else turned up on the scans. And so I rejoiced prematurely as it turned out because by early next year, I had a lymph node felt under my right armpit or axilla. And again, the scan showed nothing else. So I was just getting lymph node after lymph node. That was excised uh, in February along with clean, seven clean nodes. And at that point, the question is what to do? I had no observable lesions in my body anywhere. The local multidisciplinary team suggested chemotherapy and more radiotherapy, but I refused uh, having read up a bit and talked to a bit, but also to, through the Peter Mac team said no adjuvant treatment seemed a good idea. So I took that uh, and decided I wouldn't take any treatment. But just in case, I have a friend who's a palliative care physician and started some preliminary discussions with him. Next slide, please. Now, mine was one of those things that uh, Richard has mentioned, cancer unknown primary. In April 2015, my sister pointed out a very, very, very small, less than a pin head, a uh, needle head spot on my lip, my bottom lip, which wasn't getting bigger and I didn't even notice it. And my dermatologist who knew I had Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, diagnosed it as a BCC and cut it out, was sent off to pathology, turned out to be Merkel cell. And so she convinced me to uh, cut again to, to get cleaner margins. Again, I thought maybe that's the end. But in the middle of that year, uh, a, a growth was found on my peritoneum. And once again, I consulted the two multidisciplinary teams. The local one said, no more surgery, no more chasing rabbits down rabbit holes and start chemotherapy which I refused. And Peter Mack, uh, after an MRI said, let's try laparoscopic surgery, see how it goes. And uh, it was reasonably successful. I kept my pancreas and, and spleen, which were in threat, but there were dirty margins. When all this started to happen that I used to get uh, progression after progression after progression, I had two conflicting ideas in my mind. One was, I'm certainly going to die rather soon from this disease and it's going to be painful, so I better get used to that prospect. But at the same time, I acted and felt as though I was going to survive it. I know this sounds stupid, but it was sensible for me. It allowed me to pursue immunotherapy without a sense of panic. But here I was with no treatment at all, but needing systemic treatment. So what to do? Next slide, please. 
fortunately, my oncologist was able to organize, I don't know how, access to Keytruda, uh, Pimba Elizabeth, in October 15. Uh, first thing was to, to I had a, a price shock. The quote for a treatment for two years was $100,000. $7,000 every three weeks. Uh, over time, the price stopped, dropped to $6,000 uh, and then uh, finally free. So I've had it for every three weeks for two years and every three months for three years. I had regular scans and examinations. I had minor side effects and some have been delayed. So far, it's cost me about $90,000 and it was a fantastic bargain for me. I'm still alive five years without progression. However, most patients weren't in the favorable position financially that I was, so I volunteered to assist efforts to obtain a better deal for Merkel patients, which as noted, bore fruit as uh, putting a volume up on the PBS. Now for me, immunotherapy was an adjuvant treatment. I had no cancerous lesions to monitor. But the day I started immunotherapy, I pointed out to my, my oncologist that I had a new lump underneath the skin at the back of my head. It was too small to biopsy, so we're going to keep an, uh, a watch on it. And I had the first infusion and went to bed. The next morning when I woke up, without even stirring, this thought rushed into my head. That lump is gone. And I felt around the back there. I just couldn't feel it. The thing that was there the day before easily fell, fell, had completely disappeared. So I thought to myself, wow, this is working. This is going to work. So I've had a tremendous beneficial outcome from immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, I'm so pleased that patients are able to get access to it without going through the financial uh, necessity that I had. And that comes to my last slide, please. So if you're a patient, please join the advocacy group. Here's how you can find out how to do that. If you're not a patient, if you're a clinician or a researcher with patients, please get them to join. Two reasons. The more that the patient advocacy group can legitimately say that they're representing the interests of vast percentage of patients, the better. Secondly, it gives you access to information about trials, uh, which uh, have been very beneficial and uh, will be beneficial for the people who take part of them. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jonathan. So um, well privileged to have you as um, one of the, the speakers and um, it was wonderful to hear your story and thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you. So the next um, item on our agenda is um, support services. So first of all, I'll hand over to Professor Gerald Fogarty who's going to um, give us more information about the Amigos. Thank you so much. I think we've uh, covered a lot of this already. I'll just get up another little um, slideshow here. Um, hang on, I'll just go back to my, where am I? Uh, back to Zoom, back to here. Where do I do this now? Um, oops, sorry about this. I just want to share screen. I'll share the screen. There we go and share. I hope you can see something about the Amigos there. Yes, we can. Excellent. Great. I'll just show you one slideshow. So, so the Amigos is the Australasian Merkel Cell Carcinoma Interest Group. Um, so we've been going for probably five years now um, and we're part of uh, Melanoma Skin Cancer Trials Limited. Um, the, the, this has been a great uh, combination to have a bit of a special group within the skin cancer trial space, and we've been very well supported by Merck as well uh, in, 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 in doing things. What we've done just in the past year is we put out a, uh, uh, a fact sheet. We put that through COSA as well. Um, we also had a, a, a publication just to sort of 
get a platform to from which to describe future changes. So this this is uh, this is the uh, title of our um, uh, our publication, the changing paradigm of managing Mercosur carcinoma in Australia. And it, it's basically got a lot of people from around Australia who treat a lot of Mercosur carcinoma. We've already heard of um, um, Wen and 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 Shanine and uh, and Richard and uh, Michael and, and uh, Julia from Westmead, Alex is from North Shore, uh, Margaret's from Peter Mac, um, and, and David is also one of the leading uh, rad onks at Peter Mac and does this a lot as well. Um, so it is in, in open access. So I suppose if you go to Google and put in Paradigm, Merkel, Australia, you'll, you'll end up with this uh, article, but it just basically summarizes where it's up to and where the, where, where the disruption will happen. And the disruption will happen in, in, because in the past, this has been uh, a, a disease that's been managed by surgery, radiotherapy and uh, chemotherapy, but now the immunotherapy is starting to make big changes in how we actually apply radiotherapy and surgery. And the chemotherapy sort of gone, gone, gone into the dustbin of history, really. Uh, the, uh, there was a Merkel cell carcinoma masterclass last week, which when, when was part of that as well. And uh, we've been we've been lucky to get um, some support from the Medical Research Future Fund for both of these trials. Uh, I'm at Gotham, which when uh, explained so well. This is that first trial. Uh, you can see that there are sites in uh, uh, every mainland um, Australian state. Uh, so uh, we're very lucky in New South Wales to have quite a number of sites, but mainly because our health system is a bit more disparate. But uh, you can see that there are two sites in Queensland. There's uh, two sites in uh, Victoria, South, there's a site in South Australia, there's a site in WA. So people from all around the country can be involved in that. I think you've already been through the uh, selection criteria here. It's basically two-arm trial of um, uh, Evelimab versus placebo after local treatment's been completed for stage one to three Merkel's or carcinoma. This is local regional disease. Um, and it's been quite difficult actually from Wayne's point of view to actually get a protocol together where we could get everyone, we could hurt all the cats in terms of the different protocols, which are even within our country, uh, state to state, we treat differently uh, for local regional disease. So we've done a great job there of trying to get everyone on the same page so that we can start putting patients on the same trial. Um, and this is uh, Shanine's trial, the Gotham trial, which has um, uh, <clears throat> places in most states, uh, um, two in Queensland and one in New South Wales, one in WA, one in South Australia, one in Victoria. This is a more difficult trial to do because it does involve uh, a, a couple of randomizations uh, and also um, uh, a new, the involvement of nuclear medicine as well. Uh, so you need to have quite an engaged nuclear medicine department in your hospital in order to have that done. But this is more for metastatic disease or stage four disease. So I'm at for stage one to three. But, uh, but Gotham for stage four. Now, I think that's about it, really. Uh, um, so this is just about the Amigos. Uh, we have a vision to increase high quality care. Uh, we have, a, we have a, this is our mission statement here, all pretty straightforward, what do you expect, and these are our values. But it really is patient focused, really trying to listen to the patient voices, because if you heard from Jonathan, this is something that really does impact the patient's life. Um, and we are trying to, reach from Australia to overseas, and hopefully we'll be able to get some overseas centres involved in, in these Australian trials. So we are trying to get some industry sponsorship. Merck's been very good. Others are interested. Um, we are trying to, you know, the, uh, the, the, the breakthroughs here will come in basic science, translational science. Uh, we are trying to make use of um, uh, social media in order to spread the word that, our, that we exist. Because oftentimes when people get a a Merkel cell carcinoma, they feel very alone. They know that someone's told them, one of the clinicians, that this is serious, but they don't know anyone else in their local family or their local area that's got Merkel cell carcinoma. So through getting involved with Amigos, they can reach out and talk to people who, who are in the same situation as them, either going through treatment or completed treatment, and, and we can support each other uh, in this quite, in a journey which can be quite difficult, as we just heard from Jonathan. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, 
Okay, so I introduced everybody at the start, but I didn't introduce myself. So I'm actually Meredith Cummins I'm with the Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, and I'm the project officer and also CRA. And my history is as a, an oncology nurse for many years. So today we're going to talk about the services that um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia provides. Um, so this is a, a brief overview. So we have our net nurse who is also our IT specialist, um, Kate Wakeman. She's behind the scenes. Kate's available by phone and email um, and she's part-time but not part-time. So um, she has so much contact with all the patients and is a, a wonderful support and resource for, for everybody. Uh, we also have support groups uh, which run around Australia and I think there's about 80 support um, meetings that happen. They're in every state and at the moment they're online due to COVID uh, and they have been um, getting a lot of great attendance to that. So it's very important for many people to, to have access to support groups. It's not great for for everybody, but um, majority get so much out of it. And just being able to be able to speak to somebody who is in a, a similar sort of situation and um, able to just relate and um, go to an environment that's non-threatening and that they can just talk about things. Um, we also have a lot of written resources and you can go to our website to, to see that. We have a patient information booklet, which most patients that we have say it's like a Bible for them um, and they refer to them so frequently and um, it's very useful for the carers as well. And we have a healthcare professional information booklet, which a lot of our um, patients will take along to their GPs uh, because most GPs don't really know very much about um, neurologic, um, neuroendocrine cancer. So um, it's been very beneficial and we've had a lot of good feedback from the uh, GPs and other health professionals about the information. That We also have a nutrition booklet, uh, which talks about all the um, dietary requirements and looking for trigger foods and um, ways to sort of keep well nourished. There's wallet cards, which a lot of our patients use when they have um, carcinoid crisis or carcinoid syndrome. And there's also another card that's available um, due to the, the syndrome. They can have diary quite frequently and need to use toilets. So we have a card that's actually um, a card that they can present when they're out and about so that um, they can use the toilet quickly. And a lot of the patients also have um, where's the nearest loo on their um, phone so that they can uh, find a, a toilet close by because it can be quite debilitating for them. We also have fact sheets and um, we have a multitude of fact sheets and tonight I'm launching our Merkel cell fact sheet. Um, it's hot off the press and we've um, got it on the website so uh, we were very fortunate to have Professor Gerald Fogarty work very closely with us and um, did a lot of great editing and contribution towards this. So um, we hope that it's very beneficial to everybody. We've tried to touch on every aspect um, possible, just um, but to keep it so that it was um, concise and easy for people to, to follow. And a lot of the information came out of the article that Gerald um, spoke about before. We also have Facebook groups, um, patient private discussion groups, and we also have a, a group for the, the carers. So that's available online. And Kate did mention that um, the Cancer Council has another um, group that um, is being formed so that um, patients can actually access that when they're not a Facebook user. There's also one-to-one -one support and work closely with Cancer Connect. And Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia works very closely with all the patients to assist with any referrals that they may need, um, whether it's health uh, related or whether they need to um, be guided financially or psychologically, we're here to help. And we do a lot of advocacy work. Um, we've just completed a Senate submission of about 60 pages to um, enhance in general, the, the care that can be provided to uh, neuroendocrine patients around Australia. So we do a lot of community engagement and education and we hold patient forums nat nationally. Normally they're face-to-face, -face, but um, we're doing this one today and then on um, Tuesday next week, which is World Cancer 
um, Net Cancer Day. Uh, we're doing um, a webinar called State of the Nation and we have specialists from each state uh, presenting on um, studies and their services. So it's very exciting. Um, we can continue to do this as a, a webinar, uh, but normally we will go to each state every second year and um, do a face-to-face -face with a lot of the, um, the national specialists. We also do healthcare professional education uh, and attend conferences and do presentations and abstracts. And in services, we can do online also with um, hospitals around Australia. And I've been doing a few in New South Wales and Queensland recently. We've also got GP modules, which um, very excitedly today, um, our accreditation has come through from RACGP. So these are four modules with 40 points. Uh, so it's a third of their triennium 120 CPD points. Uh, and it covers everything from uh, pre-diagnosis all the way through to, to living with NET. So it's extremely comprehensive. Again, we want to say a huge thanks to Professor um, Gerald Fogarty because he contributed greatly to the section on Merkel cell um, carcinoma, which as we know is a neuroendocrine cancer. Uh, Kate and a few other people are working very closely um, on the COSA NET guidelines and um, revising the previous ones and updating those. And we do a lot with research and I'll just touch briefly on the Planet Registry and pla um, Patient App. And Planet is actually the optimal planning of treatment and research of neuroendocrine tumours in Australia. And um, hence it's called Planet. And we've been very fortunate to work closely with um, Ipsen and Melbourne University and our Planet Committee and also the Federal Health. So we have sites around Australia that we're um, recruiting uh, for the Planet Registry at Peter Mac, uh, Royal North Shore, uh, Queen Elizabeth, Fiona Stanley, Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital. And hopefully after we've sort of gone through all those sites, um, we can start recruiting elsewhere. But with the app, um, with sorry, with the registry, we have a, a patient app. Uh, so once they've been recruited, they can download the app on their phone. And the app is actually... Um, has several different areas that they can enter information in and it happens um, over scheduled periods of time, depending on what treatment they're having. So there's a quality of life, there's a Bristol stool scale, there's week, um, weekly vitals and there's also performance status. So it's really a living diary that um, all patients can enter the information into and it um, gets stored, um, de-identified but it also is a way that um, the patients can monitor how things are going and it actually graphs and it can be shared with their clinician. So at the end of the day with the Planet Registry, we're looking to collect data from hospitals within Australia um, and that'll be used for scientific research to improve um, the understanding and treatment of NETS. It's a great platform to be used for medical research um, through trials and studies. And with these, um, the app, the clinicians can actually do push alerts for the, the patients to say that they could possibly um, be a potential recruitment for a trial. So it's a great um, medium for um, communication from the clinician to the patient, but it doesn't go backwards. So um, yeah, patients can't communicate back. If they have anything that they need to speak to their clinicians about, they need to make an appointment or sort of ring up. Um, it also helps to identify the medical needs of NET patients and um, determine resources that we need to treat patients with NETs. And it's also an aid to planning future NET research. So um, we're very excited um, to be able to have this registry. It's the first in the world and um, a lot of um, time and effort and collaboration around Australia has um, yeah, provided this this fabulous fabulous registry and also the um, the app. And there's also um, we work very closely with the community and wherever we can to have ongoing funding for trials. A lot of the trials um, aren't funded 
by government. So um, we try very hard to just try and um, get as much information and, um, and help from the community and also um, lobby with the government to see if we can get grants and um, additional funding for trials that are, are vital for our net patients. And at the moment, we're pushing really hard to have an op an optimal care pathway for our net patients. There's a lot of other um, cancers that have got optimal care pathways, but we really, really need one for net. So we're working hard to, um, to get that addressed and get that happening. So there's how we can get in touch. Now you can get in touch with us. Um, there's lots of um, valuable information on the website. We also encourage patients and healthcare professionals to um, contact us and become part of the um, newsletters that come out. So we have a patient newsletter that goes out monthly and then every two months we have the healthcare professionals. So we put any new information into those and um, promote any publications that any of our specialists um, have um, contributed to or written. So um, we just, yeah, want the community to, um, oops, sorry, uh, community to be, to be part of us and for us to be part of you. So I'll finish up my presentation and it's now time for questions. So I will stop sharing. And, and I will hand over to Simone. <laughs> thank you, Meredith. And wow, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Gerald, um, Jonathan, amazing, uh, Wynne and Richard. We really, really appreciate this for, especially for, you know, this group of patients with a huge high unmet need. And I, I think it's just so admirable what the Amigos have been able to achieve. Um, and especially with, you know, the, the listing of Avelumab, um, you know, this is something that is, is it's really, you know, globally recognised and, and I think, you know, well done to, and, and the clinical trials that are coming off. Um, there was some, some chat in the Q&A, which I do believe uh, has probably been answered, but I guess it's an interesting question around reimbursement of PET. Um, you know, for our, for our neuro and consumer patients, you know, the combination of both FDG, depending on the receptors on the tumours, and also gallium-68 is, is hugely important. Um, so thank you for, for clarifying that. But if you just wanted to talk about, I mean, that's something that we are really trying to push forward because we do see restrictions in reimbursement for not only diagnosis, but this is a tool that really needs to be used in ongoing management for net patients and, and really should be used not just for the origin of where the near end consumer is, but definitely what the receptors um, are on those tumours. So, Gerald or when are you happy just to talk about, you know, uh, what you're trying to push forward for, for FDG rather than that you're pushing forward for Gallium 68? So, um, so when did you want to talk to this or are you happy for me uh, to? Yeah, sure, I, I'm happy to comment. So, um, so I think accurate staging is, is fundamental to, um, you know, sort of devising the best management to a cancer. And we know that functional imaging with FDG PET is more accurate, it's more sensitive than conventional CT staging, I think. Um, so, so certainly FDG PET um, should really be a standard of care in terms of staging Merkels. Uh, so that's not currently MBS reimbursed. And I think we should really advocate for, for the government to consider reimbursing FDG PETs. In terms of dotatate PET, so, so Merkels being a high-grade neuroendocrine cancer is almost invariably FDG avid. Um, Dotatate, um, in terms of um, somatostatin receptor uptake, Merkel's is probably variable. At this stage, that's still experimental. Um, that is what we're trying to look at in the Gotham trial. But at this stage, um, Dotatate PET, I, I wouldn't say is, is, is a must in terms of staging. But FDG PET is something we should really push for reimbursement around Australia. I think currently um, at the larger hospitals, it probably is done as a standard of care already, but currently the hospitals have had to absorb that cost and, and the access is not even for patients in regional areas and, and perhaps out in private. So, so I think that that's an important thing we should advocate for. Absolutely. And that's definitely, sorry, Gerald. So, 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 so I just wanted to add the, the, um, uh, 
the use of penultimate and surveillance. So we tend to use, uh, we tend to treat locally and regionally with surgery and radiotherapy and then follow patients with PET. Now that's very controversial. Uh, we tried to get some data out there ourselves just by looking at six patients where, where um, PET had made a real difference, uh, early PET. Uh, and, and usually if, if you look at all the recurrences with PET, they usually happen in the first year. So you don't need many PETs. And so usually my practice is to do a PET every four months after people get uh, the local or regional treatment done. And you can even have a, a, a PET, that a, a, a lesion that is only millimetres uh, in diameter, but they get distant disease. And if you can get that diagnosed early, they get on immunotherapy early when they're much fitter, uh, rather than waiting for symptoms to come from that distant disease. So. So that, that is the part of the battle, not just getting it for staging, but also getting it for continued surveillance. It shouldn't be because of the government because Merkel cell carcinoma is not a common tumor. And uh, I think you only need to do it uh, for probably two years max. And people who get out to two years probably don't need a PET after that. Uh, there could also be space in this area for blood tests as well. We don't have that, that, that at the moment in Australia, but that may also be able to determine when you do uh, 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 a PET scan if we can find a blood marker that is that is uh, reliable uh, in Merkel. Absolutely. And look, I think it's an ongoing discussion and it was probably the, the focus, as, well, as I mentioned, of our um, submission to the House of the House of Reps inquiry recently. And as Jonathan mentioned, the high costs are debilitating, obviously, with the treatment that Jonathan had to do. And Jonathan's so grateful to you, all the advocating that you did to then get... Um, yeah. Uh, you know, on the PBS, it's not it's not easy, and we we know all so well. But you know, we also we see those discrepancies even within our patient group about private and public, as you mentioned. When you know yeah. the public hospitals generally absorb these costs and know how important these tests are for staging, as well as diagnosis and and ongoing management, it actually stops potential. Um, uh, interventions that won't work and and, yeah. and it can actually show the ones that can work so we are absolutely uh, on to trying to get greater access especially because it is really it's, it's it's a vital part of treatment as well as as diagnosis um, I just had a question and I'm sorry I'm going to check the uh, chat box as well I um, had a question with regards to the IMAP trial uh, which is really ex uh, both the IMAT trial and the Gotham trial, which is really exciting. And I'm just so pleased to see MRFF getting behind uh, what, what they were talking about with access to rare cancer trials. Um, with the, the Evolumab and PRT, I guess that would be an exciting thing to see what other nets that might actually be able, any evidence there for other nets, not just um, Merkel cell, because the, the combination therapy of, of um, um, uh, sorry, of immunotherapy and PRT hasn't really been explored much in any other, other neuroendocrine tumours. So that's exciting. And I guess the other, que uh, the question is, that's a statement, the question is around recruitment. You know, this is a really hard group of patients to get to. Um, with regards to age and and um, and also the the disease and and how much it progresses and I and I hope that the GP modules will help with trying to educate primary healthcare um, more so on this. But what are you sort of trying to? How are you going to try and get to these patients to get them onto these trials? So one thing we've done is we've, we've uh, looked at the putting that little uh, banner onto the histopathology forms. So we're trying to work through now with the yeah. uh, College of uh, Pathologists in order to get the, in order to get them in to uh, endorse that. Richard Scully is doing that for us. Um, uh, the other thing is just trying is just trying to educate uh, primary care. Most skin in Australia is looked after by primary care, which they do a good job, but um, but in this situation where where let's face it, some people in primary care might not have even been exposed to local in their in their undergraduate years. So, so this is a, a postgraduate uh, uh, play. Uh, we have tried to do. We we are working very closely with the skin cancer GPs uh, college, also with the dermatology college as well. Uh, it's funny though that that the, the pathways of uh, of how people go here. I, I'm pretty lucky. I've got a name for treating Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, usually I've got at least one Merkel cell carcinoma on radiotherapy treatment at any one time. They, they're going through five weeks of treatment. But there's some dermatologists that prefer paid cases to me for other things. 
that have never seen a Merkel in their whole professional life. So these guys have been out there for 10, 15 years mm -hmm. and never had a Merkel. Now, sometimes I wonder, these are very good dermatologists, sometimes I wonder, well, have they, you know, have, you know, because it is very tempting sometimes when someone's got, got 10 lesions to actually uh, freeze them rather than cut them. So I hope the, 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 the Merkel was actually cut and not frozen and tend for histology, histopathology. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to raise the, raise the awareness that, uh, that, you know, if you get a sudden onset of a, of a, of a purple lump more under the skin than in the skin, you need to, we need to think laterally to think, well, this could be Merkel's or carcinoma. Absolutely. Awareness is key. And when did you say, want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I agree with uh, with Gerald. I, I think um, I think one one key thing to mention is that um, you know when a Merkel cell is diagnosed, um, I really encourage um, all primary carers to refer them to to the bigger hospitals that have MDTs. And and um, so I mean there be a, a small proportion of um, so clinicians that that you know might be quite familiar and and, and perhaps have a um, can specialize in Merkels, but but most of these cases, you know, are probably going to be diagnosed in primary care where you might see one every every few years and you, you may see, you know, one or two in a lifetime. And I think um, one of the areas we are trying to focus is to get um, some sort of um, widespread pathology flagging of these cancers to say, A, that they should be referred to, to high volume centers and B, to to maybe list a link for, for possible open clinical trials. So I think that you know, if that was an automated um, process in the larger pathology providers, I think that that's one good way of, of picking these patients up. Thanks. Absolutely. I think Richard, maybe this might be a question for you. We have a, a patient who's asked a question that says in the space of two years, she's been diagnosed with a parathyroid adenoma, a carcinoid net tumor in the lung, and most recently a MCC. She's been tested for MEN1, but it came back negative. Could there still be a link with these three? I know that that's a difficult question to ask without being, a, uh, you know, to, to put you on the spot, but it is an interesting thing that they, we talk about sporadic and then hereditary as well and not having me in one there. And I know this is your area of expertise. Yeah, look, I mean, in terms of Merkel cell carcinoma and familial disease, there's not a strong link there. Um, and we do, I mean, there's been cases of described of um, siblings developing Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, there's been, you know, people are curious about why that has occurred. Um, the youngest patient we've probably seen is uh, 36, which is quite young for Merkel cell carcinoma. Typically, it's arising in, in more elderly people. So I guess we don't really know if there's hereditary, any hereditary basis um, to developing Merkel cell carcinoma. So that's the first thing to say. It hasn't been associated with any um, germline risk. Um, though the other, the other tumours that um, Marilyn has mentioned are, are linked to um, multiple endocrine neoplasia. Um, and I assume that's why she's been tested for MEN1. Mm. <clears throat> I'd say that the, 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 um, the development of these, these different diseases are quite different. Merkel cell carcinoma um, is very different to um, those two other two tumour types. Um, so there's not a great link there in terms of other than that they're all neuroendocrine. Yeah. And they commonly express these markers, but they're very, very different diseases. And I think that, you know, in the context of what I presented today, um, you know, we've got some pretty... Um, well-known um, or um, convincing sort of drivers of this disease, one being a virus and, and the other being excessive sun exposure. I, I, I tend to think, I can't say for certain, but I, I, it's probably just a chance event um, uh, that uh, Marilyn's developed these three different diseases um, in, a, in a very short space of time, it seems. <laughs> Marilyn, I hope, um, uh, sorry, you know, I know that that hasn't probably really answered any questions and I think you're probably left with more, more questions, but, you know, it is a, it's really, really difficult when we try and uh, connect these and neuroendocrine tumours, I think, create even a more difficult uh, space in that they can be so, um, so variable. Um, I think 
I've got another question here. I'm not sure if it's a question, but um, my, M my Merkel cell carcinoma has resurfaced four times at about nine month intervals. I'm waiting for my radiotherapy schedule, which is to be followed by immunotherapy. Therapy. This is my first time using immunotherapy as a treatment. What is the recommended time to start um, after radiotherapy? And what is the normal treatment time? That's from Tim. I think, Gerald, is that something that you'd Gerald, be able to... Well, well, we would normally give uh, radiotherapy fairly quickly following any surgery or any local, um, local uh, uh, exacerbation. Um, normally, the time the, the immunotherapy, there's a couple of logistic things here, but we certainly don't want to uh, cause any double up in toxicity. Someone's radiotherapy can cause a bit of toxicity, as we heard from Jonathan. Uh, so th normally the logistics in hospital would be to start immunotherapy probably three to four weeks following the radiotherapy. That would be the normal thing in in in, in my in, in the medical oncologist that I refer to. I don't know what when when has any uh, any light on that at all. Yeah, thanks, Gerald. Um, I think, I mean, in the IMAT trial, we're actually looking at concurrent um, immunotherapy with radiotherapy. Um, I mean, there are some other diseases where this has been looked at and, and the safety data is reasonable, but I think it really depends on the field of the radiotherapy. So I think I'd, I'd be concerned, for example, if, you know, a large lung was irradiated, you know, there may be a higher risk there, but I think if it's... Um, um, if it's you know more peripheral nodal, I, I probably would be comfortable um, to give it concurrently. But but look, undoubtedly there could be an increased um, risk of toxicity slightly. Um, but I don't think it's as as great as giving chemotherapy and radiotherapy together. And I think the timing of when I would give a radio immunotherapy would depend on sort of the clinical scenario for someone that's got a lot of other burden of visceral disease outside the radiation field that needs a response systemically quickly, you know, I, I wouldn't want to waste time and I, I probably wouldn't wait for three or four weeks to start the immunotherapy. But, but if it's just adjuvant radiotherapy, there's otherwise NED or small volume disease, I, I don't think there's any rush to give the immunotherapy. And I think I'd, I'd be cautious and, and, and agree with Jared and just wait for a few weeks for the radiation toxicity to settle down. Can I just say something here, Simone? Uh, this is I'm just sort of waving the radiotherapy flag here. Um, systemic therapies have progressed enormously and we're very grateful to the scientists for doing that, to progressing from chemotherapy to immunotherapy, but there has been advances in, in radiotherapy as well. And so now we use a lot more targeted radiotherapy. Uh, there's a lot there's, uh, we can use, and this is where PET scanning actually helps us a lot because PET, uh, the PET platform actually talks to our radiation planning facilities. So getting PETs actually helps us to aim the radiotherapy much more efficiently, giving more dose to tumour, less dose to normal structures. So getting more survival, more tumour cure for less side effects. So even the radiotherapy that Jonathan had five, you know, six years ago would be given very differently today. Uh, radiotherapy back in the day, even those in, even six years ago, used to be called 3D conformal radiotherapy. That came in boxes and cubes and, and blocks. Whereas really now what we, we have a new way of giving radiotherapy called got a long name it's called volumetric modulated arc therapy that's why we call it vmat because it is such a long name but um, this is basically where the radiotherapy is a lot more conformal so rather than having rather than having a lot of uh, uh, normal tissue bystanding you know getting hit by radiotherapy in the entrance or exit beam through, through a bystander effect and having side effects we can actually be a lot more conformal to aiming the radiotherapy just to where the cancer is so i think that that you know the the, the chance of having um, added, additive uh, toxicities from both systemic therapy and radiotherapy are much less now in this current day than they were back in back even six years ago uh, if people use modern radiotherapy techniques. It's, it's amazing how much everything has become just so much more targeted and, and the hope that it does um, provide, you know, uh, less toxicity for the patients. And, um, you know, Jonathan, even with sharing your story, you, you went through so much. And I think, um, you know, it's a credit to you for, for staying positive and, and, and knowing that that's all, um, you know, what you've gone through. And I'm sure you've got words of advice for Tim. Um, uh, and I hope that Tim has obviously seen that there, there's some positivity as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I was just fantastically lucky. I think that was all. <laughs> I didn't do anything that happened to me. But uh, 
but it, as Gerald points out, things have moved tremendously in such a short time that the situation I would be in if I had what, the first diagnosis now instead of 2014 would be phenomenally much better. It is. It's incredible. And again, credit to Amigos and, and to, to Merck that, you know, you're pushing forward with this sometimes, you know, a forgotten patient set that, you know, we, we feel our nets are sometimes a little bit in the heart too hard basket. So it's a real credit to you all for, for driving all of this. So, um, you know, really forward and, and, um, and we really thank you for that. I don't think we have any more questions, but if we do get any more, we will absolutely um, forward them on. And in the, in the interest of time, we know that it's uh, uh, nearly dinner time. And uh, for those in Melbourne who still are working from home, I can hear the smashing around in the kitchen, which is always um, a little treat for me to go out to. But um, I really, I'll, I'll hand over to Meredith, but thank you um, to all of you for giving up your time to this really important uh, webinar and thank you to Merck for sponsoring it. Um, and we look forward to working with you in the future and in any way we can promoting trials. And, and also we would love, you know, Merkel cell to be part of our, our planet registry and patient reported outcome app as well. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much for organising it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you everybody for, yeah, it was fabulous. And some of the little um, tips that we've got sort of in our little chat at the side, thank you, Wen, we will um, sort that one out. So, um, yeah, and thank you for um, the, well, congratulations and everything for the work that we've been doing. We, we really enjoy being able to provide a fabulous service to our patients and to the community and to other healthcare professionals. And we appreciate your input um, Gerald, Gwen and Richard, so much. And Jonathan, you're a treasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. And I have, sorry, I just have one more, one more thing to, to, to just say, and I, sorry, it was remiss of me, but my, our fabulous net nurse Kate has actually reminded me, you know, there, there may have been some pictures or some statistics that may have caused, um, if they had caused any uh, concern to any of the participants um, seeing or viewing tonight, uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact with our specialist net nurse, Kate, on 1300 287 363. But all of the details are also on our website and she's more than happy to talk through anything because sometimes it, especially newly diagnosed, it can be very confronting um, and we're here to support in any way we can and also through to the Amigos as well. So thank you, Kate, for reminding me of that. <laughs> And um, thank you to Merck. And when people are leaving, there will be a link for um, an evaluation form. So um, we hope that we can do more of these more often with everybody. So thank you so much and have a lovely evening. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.